All right, so on Friday we left off actually with this question here about the ball hitting the sand trap, but I think we finished that one in class, yeah? Yeah, we went over that. Okay, so um, what I want you guys to do is, okay, these two questions here use same formula, all right? So it's the acceleration formula. Um, and I want you guys to give these ones a try and then we'll walk through them together, okay? Determining which formula you have to use and then manipulating. You should be able to do these with one formula. If you're using two, okay, then you're doing too many steps and too much work, right? These should both be able to be solved with one formula only. Uh, and then also watching question number two, because they do this whole, they gave you something in kilometers per hour, but then gave you meters per second squared for acceleration. So you will need to convert the kilometers per hour to meters per second before you can do any math. All right, so give you guys a couple minutes right, to try those two, and then we'll walk through them together. Okay, so for number one, we have this skier who's moving down a uniform slope at three meters per second. All right, so VI is 3.0 meters per second. Okay, the acceleration down the hill, so I should write that this is downhill, because that'll be important. Okay, the acceleration is also down the hill at 4.0 meters per second squared. Okay, uh, and then we have, we're looking for the displacement of the skier after a time of 5.0 seconds. All right, so we have VI, we have A, we have T, and we're looking for D, which means this is the formula we're gonna use. D equals VI times T plus one half AT squared. And this is a formula that gives people lots of trouble when it comes to manipulation. All right, so we're gonna walk through some of the manipulations here in just a minute. Um, so we've got um, that, in this case, we have an actual VI. We're looking for D, so we don't have to manipulate it. Okay? All we have to do is plug in our number. So we're going to have 3.0 times 5.0 plus 1 half times 4.0, the acceleration, times 5 squared. Okay? And guys, most of, more often than not, when people make a mistake with this, it's that they've just done the order of operations wrong or they've forgotten to square T okay, at some point. So when we punch all that in, Okay, so we have three times five plus, we have 0. 0.5 times four times five squared. All right, so that should give us 65 meters downhill. Okay, two significant figures. All right, here's where the book and myself and Mr. Dickey differ. Myself and Mr. Dickey are right. The book is wrong. Okay, but here's where we differ. We say downhill is different than down. Down is straight down. Downhill is some angle other than straight down. So if a question says down the hill or down the ramp, write down the hill or down the ramp. Down means it fell through the hill and it's headed straight for the center of the earth somehow. Okay, just so you know, there is a difference between down and down a hill. All right. Okay, how are we doing on number two? Are we ready to go over two? Or do we need a little more time? Hands up if you need more time. Okay, let's go through it then. All right, um, so for number two, okay, we have a motorcycle that's going 100 kilometers per hour. That's not gonna be good for me. I've gotta convert that to meters per second. It's 27.7, right? Repeating? Yeah, meters per second. Okay, um, and then it applies the brakes. Here's the key to this question. Brakes produce what kind of an acceleration? Negative. All right, and it does that for one minute. Well, I gotta have that in seconds, so I can't use minutes and seconds in meters per second squared and stuff. So, all right, now we wanna look for how far does the motorcycle travel during this time? So again, it's set up so we don't have to manipulate it, all right? But we should learn how, and then which I'm going to show you here in a minute. So we got D is VI times T plus again one half AT squared. So we're going to have our um, 27.7 times um, 60 plus one half times negative 0.8 times 60 squared. All right, just so I get all the decimals here, I'm going to get the right number. Okay, so we're going to multiply that by 60, okay, and then we're going to add that to um, 0.5 times negative 0.8 times 60 
squared. All right, so we get uh, 227 meters. And since they only asked uh, how far, actually, we only have two significant figures here. So 2.3 times 10 to the 2 meters. We don't have to put a direction on that, okay, because we weren't ever given one. Okay, everybody all right with that one? Okay, manipulations of this formula, because it can be tricky. All right, so here's our initial setup. D equals VI times T plus 1 half AT squared. If I'm looking for, let's say, A, what should I move first? Right, the VI times T. I would multiply them before I added it to this, so I'm just going to subtract VI times T over to the other side. So I'll have D minus VI times T equals 1 half AT squared. Now I just want to solve for A. So I just divide off the two things I don't want, which is the half and the t squared. And I'm good to go. All right. Everybody with me on that one? What if I want to solve for vi? What should I move first? It, what should I move Exactly, it comes over here. So D minus one half AT squared equals VI times T. And then I divide both sides by T. Here's the mistake people make. They go, oh, T on the bottom, T squared on the top. They must cancel. No, they don't. Okay, I have a subtraction operation up here. I have to respect that. This has to be done and then divide by the bottom. Everybody follow? Okay, common mistake there. All right, so those ones are kind of the basic manipulations of that formula. Where it gets tricky is if you have to solve for T, because T is obviously in two places, okay? It's even tricky for me. Every time I teach this lesson, I have to sit down and manipulate the quadratic formula in order to get the correct manipulation, because I never do it right. This, is, this was like my fourth try. That's why I don't teach math. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so here's what we've got. If I want to solve for t, in most situations for you, you will never be asked to solve for t if vi is something other than zero. Okay, that's just the way the curriculum of studies is, is made because we can't guarantee you've taken quadratics when you have take when you take physics. You might take math second semester, right? So they can't guarantee you've done that yet. So it's not in the curriculum of studies saying you have to be able to manipulate for t if vi is something other than zero, which is why none of the questions in the book asked you to do it, right? But if vi is zero, manipulating for t is very easy because vi times t is zero, and then you just divide the half of a over in square root and you're done. Okay, so as long as vi is zero, that formula is easy to solve for t. But were vi to not be zero, okay, then you would essentially have to make this like a quadratic equation. So you'd set it up here. We have ax, ax squared plus bx plus c, right? Okay, and we have to manipulate for x, which is in two places. So when we do that, okay, we end up with um, that x equals negative b plus then the square root of b squared minus 4ac. How many people have done this before? Quadratics. Okay, a few of you. All right, so you can tell me if I screw up. All right, uh, divided by 2a. Okay, that's how we separate x. Okay, uh, from the two places where it is. So we end up with that. Then what we do is we substitute back in from this formula up here, okay, the actual variables. And so x is t, all right? And uh, b becomes vi, and a is actually acceleration, and c is d, okay? So when it all gets said and done, and you're never gonna have to do this, okay? t will equal um, the square root of v squared, plus 2ad minus v over a. You won't ever have to do that, OK? Because it's not in the program of studies. But somebody always inevitably asks, and then I embarrass myself. And I was ready today. Time. 
All right. Um, so like I said, you're never going to be asked to, to manipulate for T if VI is not zero. You will be asked to solve for T, but VI will be zero in any questions you get involving that. Okay. All right. I want you to write this example down. Okay. Not, this is another formula now. Okay. And see if we can figure it out. What formula are we going to use? Okay. And how are we going to solve it? So I'll give you a couple minutes to try this one, and then we'll go through it together. Okay. And let's walk through this one. So it tells us that the speedboat slows down at a rate of five meters per second squared. So they're giving us the acceleration and telling us that it's negative. Okay, and it comes to a stop, so they told us VF is zero meters per second. Then they tell us that this process takes 15 seconds and we're looking for the displacement. Okay, so in one formula, that would be this one. D equals VF times T minus one half AT squared. So the reverse of the one we just used a minute ago, right? This is the one that finds the whole rectangle on the acceleration or the velocity time graph and then subtracts the triangle away, okay? Uh, whereas the other one finds um, finds it the opposite. All right, so we just have to plug in our numbers here. We don't need uh, to, to do any manipulating. VF is zero, so I don't even need it. I'm just gonna say that this is, uh, well, actually I should put it in there because it's gonna be zero minus, okay? Zero minus one half AT squared. Okay, plug in my numbers. Zero minus one half times negative five times uh, T squared. So 15 squared, right? The reason I'm keeping the zero in there is adding to zero is not the same as subtracting from zero. If I don't keep the zero in there, I'll get a negative number. And it's impossible for me to move backwards while slowing down. Okay, so I don't want to get a negative number for displacement here. I want to get a positive number and leaving the zero in there will ensure that that happens for me. Okay. So zero minus 0.5 times negative five. Oh, and I put plus in there. I should have put minus, minus um, that's times 15 squared. All right, so we're looking at they're going to travel uh, 562.5 meters, but we only have two significant figures there. So we'll say 5.6 times 10 to the two meters. And we'll put a positive on that because really that's about all we were given in the question. Actually, I don't think they even asked, did they ask for displacement or did they ask how far? I don't find the displacement. So we'll put a positive on there. Questions on that one? All right, try those two. Um, yeah, try those two. You can do number one, even though it asks you to find time. Okay, remember that VF in, if VF or VI is zero, then you can still do it. Okay, so for number one, okay, um, it's an arresting device. So if you've ever seen like a plane land on an aircraft carrier, they have a little hook that drops down from the bottom of the plane and it catches these wires or cables that go across the deck. And those cables are attached to big, essentially braking systems that pull the plane to a stop before it careens off the other end of the carrier because they're not that long, okay? You can't land a plane conventionally on an aircraft carrier. There's just not enough length there, okay? Uh, so this thing will stop them in 150 meters with this acceleration and this is like, pretty hard jerk, okay? It's greater than gravity, right? Your brakes in your car can't do this. This is like hitting something, right? It is like really hard on the, on the pilots. That's why they have the big harnesses and stuff, all right? So we need to find the time it takes the plane to come to a stop. So what we're told is the displacement is 150 meters. We're told the acceleration is negative 15 meters per second squared, and we know it comes to a stop. It's, a, it's an arresting device after all. So we know what VF is. We're looking for T. So we have that D equals VF times T minus one half AT squared. Since VF is zero, VF times T is also zero. So I'm just gonna write it here, okay? I might wanna take that out in a minute when I start manipulating and I probably will, okay? All right, so here's what I've got. I've got zero minus this. Now, um, if I wanna find T, that means I have to move the zero over. Well, there's no sense adding or subtracting zero. So I'm gonna get rid of it, but I'm gonna leave that negative sign here, 
because it'll give me the right sign on my time later. If you come up with a negative time, it's just because you forgot to bring the negative along. Okay, I'm looking for T, so I'm going to divide both sides by negative one-half of A. So I've got negative one-half, and I know that A is negative as well. Negative times a negative will give me a positive, and I'll end up with a positive T, which is important because I actually have to square root this in order to get t. And if you didn't bring that negative over, your calculator probably told you you were doing something wrong because you can't take the square root of a negative number. Okay, so if that happened to you, that's why. Okay, so I've got uh, 150 meters on the top. That's my displacement. Negative 1 half times negative 15. All right, and when we do that, we should get 4 and a half seconds. So square root of 150 divided by um, in brackets negative 0.5 times negative 15. Okay, 4.47 seconds, so 4.5 to two significant figures. All right. Okay, give you a few more minutes on number two. Remember they did this stupid kilometer an hour thing again, so you got to convert. Um, we have, uh, in this one here, it says the Corvette took 6.2 seconds to accelerate to 160 kilometers per hour. It doesn't say what it accelerated from. We would assume it's from rest, but we don't want to make assumptions. There's enough information given in the question that we don't have to assume that. Okay, we know what VF is. We know what the, uh, ex we know what the time is, and we know the displacement. So we don't need to assume that it started from rest, which is good because that's not always a safe assumption. All right, so let's have a look at the second one here. All right, so the 68 Corvette took 6.2 seconds, so they tell us the time, okay, 6.2 seconds, to accelerate to 160 kilometers per hour. That's 100 miles an hour, okay? This was a pretty respectable time for 1968, okay? There's cars today that can't do that. Granted, they're small, but, you know, they're... They're still. Okay, uh, so we need kilometers per hour in meters per second for our VF. Okay, so we take our 160 and we divide it by 3.6. Okay, so we got 44.4 repeating as our final velocity in meters per second. Uh, and it traveled 220 meters during that time. All right, so we are looking for the acceleration. So. We're going to have D equals VF times T minus one half AT squared. And we're solving for A. So the first thing I want to do um, is move the VFT over. Okay? Or I could add one half AT squared over and then I get rid of the negatives, okay? which is kind of what I like to do. So I'm going to go D plus one half AT squared okay? equals VF times T. All right? Then I'm going to bring the D over. Okay, by subtracting it, and then I'm going to divide the half eight, uh, the half t squared onto this side. That will leave me with a over there, and I don't have any negatives um, to deal with now. Okay, so when I plug in my numbers, okay, I'm going to have 44.4 um, repeating uh, times the 6.2 seconds, and then I'm going to subtract the 220 meters from that. And then I'm going to divide by one half times 6.2 squared, right? And that should give me my 2.9 meters per second squared. So 6.2 okay, minus 220, and then divide that by 0. 0.5 times 6.2 squared. Whoop. All right, so we got 2.9 meters per second squared for our acceleration there. All right, questions on that one? Okay, so we got one formula left that we haven't gone over yet. So it probably fits with that one. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a minute here to try this one. I'll blow it up and make it a bit bigger here. Okay, give it a try. All right, let's have a look at this one. So when when you start out, okay, so the question starts with the trigger is pulled in this gun, 
right? How fast is the bullet going before the trigger gets pulled? Zero, okay? And we have, that's an assumption that we can safely make in this question, is that VI is zero, okay? A bullet starts from rest when it's in a rifle, okay? Um, the, the displacement of this thing while the acceleration is going on is the length of the barrel of the gun, which is 0 0.750 meters, okay? Once the bullet leaves the barrel of the gun, it's no longer being accelerated okay, by, the, by the gun itself, right? Then it's actually starting to slow down. Um, the only reason it's accelerated through the barrel is because the expanding gases from detonating the gunpowder force it out of the barrel. If you've ever seen, sometimes they do like the CG slow-mo of the, the bullet spinning through the barrel and you can see the rifling through the barrel. Okay, so you get this explosion, the expanding gases push, push the uh, bullet out the barrel. Okay, the bigger the explosion, the faster it can go. Okay. Um, so we've got that distance there and we know that it's going to reach, uh, it's, sorry, it's gonna experience an acceleration of 5.35 times 10 to the five meters per second squared. Okay, that is a massive acceleration, but it has to be. Okay, when a bullet leaves the barrel of a rifle, it is often traveling far faster than the speed of sound. Okay, like we could say two to almost three times as fast, depending on the rifle being used. Okay, what that means is you don't hear the bullet. Okay, um, the, currently the world record for the longest kill shot by a sniper is held by a Canadian sniper. And it's like four kilometers. Okay. It is insane that someone could hit a target at that distance. But it also means that the person he hit did not hear the sound of the shot because it would be way behind the projectile itself. Okay. So imagine that you would not hear the shot that kills you pretty scary okay um but yeah they've actually got like footage of like through the sniper's scope of people being shot at and they look down because they see the bullet hit the ground not because they hear it but because they well not because they hear the shot but because they hear the sound of the bullet hitting the ground near them and the puff of dirt okay um that's how fast those bullets can travel okay um so what we're looking for here is the final velocity of the bullet okay as it exits the barrel we have VI, we have D, we have A, and we're looking for VF. T is not part of our givens, so the only formula we can use is this one. VF squared equals VI squared plus 2AD. All right, that's the formula we have to use here. And we're looking for VF, so we only have to do one very minor manipulation. What is that? This formula solves for VF squared. I want just VF, so I have to square root everything, okay? Basically, I just do this, and now I have VF, all right? So when I plug in my numbers, I'm gonna be looking at zero squared plus two times 5.35 times 10 to the five times 0 0.750. Okay, so we're gonna have the square root of uh, two times, and then in brackets for our scientific notation, Okay, so this thing will be traveling at 895 meters per second. That's almost three times the speed of sound, okay, when it exits the barrel of the gun, okay, so very, very fast. Okay, and we have three significant figures there, so we can leave it at 895. So you're not going to outrun that. Okay. Unless you are in like, let's say like a modern jet fighter. Okay. They can actually, some of them are actually fast enough that if, if their chain gun on another fighter is used to shoot at them, they can actually outrun the bullets. Okay. If they're going fast enough, okay. like at their top speed. All right. Questions on that one. Everyone understand how that one works? Okay. Manipulations for this formula. Okay. Pretty straightforward. So we got VF squared equals VI squared plus 2AD. If I'm looking for VI, all I do is bring the 2AD over. So I would have VF squared, um, sorry, minus, not equals, minus 2AD. And then I would have to square root that 
would equal VI. Okay, and that's probably the easiest of the manipulations. Okay, if I'm looking for either A or D, then I subtract VI over. So I have VF squared minus VI squared okay, over 2A would give me D or over 2D would give me A. All right, that is a formula we will use often when we are talking about projectile motion. Okay, so it's one you're going to need to be able to use easily. All right, I'll make those a little bit bigger. I want you guys to try those too, because they use that formula there. Actually, number one has two different parts. They do give you time, so there's two. There's a few ways to do number one. I'll let you choose which way you want to do. Okay, but number two, you'll have to use that formula we just went over. Okay, let's have a look at question one here. Right, so for question number one, we're told at least in, in the beginning part of this question that we know VI is 70 meters per second. We know that VF is zero meters per second. And we know that the time is 29 seconds. Okay, Part A wants us to find the acceleration. And I would say our best bet for a formula on that one is our change in velocity over change in time formula. Okay, Don't even have to manipulate it to get acceleration, so that's probably a good choice. All right, so we'll have 0 minus 70 uh, divided by 29 seconds. Okay, so I'm just going to go negative 70 okay, divided by 29. And give us an acceleration of negative 2.4 meters per second squared. Okay. All right. Um, Everybody all right with that? Okay. One of the things that, again, we don't like about the way the textbook writes things, okay, negative forward. Just write backward. Negative forward is like, oh, well, I'm not right-handed. I'm negative right-handed. Nobody says that. It's stupid. Okay. Don't write negative forward. Just write backward. Makes way more sense. Okay. So don't write it that way. Okay, part B says, what length of run runway is required for the jet to come safely to a complete stop? Well, we now have VI, we have VF, we have T, we have A. We could use any formula we wanted at this point to calculate D, all right? Um, but it's up to you. In my, in my case, I would probably go with um, one that's you know pretty straightforward that already solves for D because I don't need to, uh, then I don't need to manipulate, okay? And it eliminates the, possibilities of me making a mistake, right? If I can avoid a way that, you know, brings in more work that could make a mistake, then I will do it. So we'll have our 70 times um, 29 seconds plus one half times the number we just calculated, negative 2.4, um, but I would keep all the decimals there, okay? Uh, times T, which was 29 seconds, all squared, okay? That should give us our one kilometer forward. Okay, that's one kilometer, okay, to two significant figures, 1,015 meters. Okay, but again, you could have used any one of the formulas to solve part B because you had enough information to do it. How many people have done number two? Okay, let's look at that one then too. Okay, so on ramps are designed so that motorists can move seamlessly into highway traffic. Well, they're designed that way, unless you live in Calgary, where they take out one set of traffic lights, build an interchange that has four sets of lights on it. You all know which one I'm talking about. That stupid X thing they built on 162nd and McLeod that they touted as being the most brilliant thing ever, but is actually worse. Anyway, um, so on ramps are designed so they can move seamlessly into highway traffic. Okay, if a car needs to increase its speed from 50, so from, that would indicate that's my initial, 50 kilometers per hour, okay, uh, to 100 kilometers per hour, okay, uh, using uh, an acceleration of 3.8 meters per second squared, 
Okay, what's the minimum length of the on-ramp? And this is an actual calculation that a, you know, like a city planner or overpass designer would have to use okay, in order to safely determine the length of the on-ramp. And you want to make sure you do that because there's nothing worse than having people merging on, onto a high-speed road at less than the speed limit. Okay, I mean, you've seen that happen all the time out here. Okay, when you're, when you're merging onto uh, the Highway 2 okay, from the little interchange out, out north here, okay? Because, I mean, people, they come around that corner and they just don't accelerate and they're merging over and there's people going 120 coming behind them and they're only going 70, okay? You got to get up to speed and get over, right? Fortunately, that ramp is actually designed fairly well. Those two lanes both free flow all the way up the hill, okay? There's more than enough time for people to get up to speed should they choose to depress the pedal on the right and actually get there, okay? Um, before the top of the hill. Okay, so we are looking for a length of the on-ramp, so we're going to go with this. VF squared equals VI squared plus 2AD. Okay, we need to convert these to meters per second. All right, this one was 44.4 repeating meters per second, and then this is half of that, so it's got to be 22.2 meters per second. Um, so now we can plug those numbers in. We got to solve for D, so we're going to manipulate. We're going to have VF squared minus vi squared over 2a so we'll have 44.4 squared uh, minus 22.2 squared okay, divided by 2 times 3.8 and, and we should end up with 76 meters for our answer there okay. all right questions on any of those okay so I'm going to have you work on just some problem solving today. I want you to practice up, okay, off this worksheet for a little bit because tomorrow uh, we're going to have a quiz on acceleration. And depending on how that goes, we might move straight on to uh, vector addition tomorrow. Okay, if we do well on that quiz, then, you know, we don't need to spend a lot of time on Basically, this is just algebra. You learned about acceleration last year. Okay, so this is just using new formulas. Um, we will have a lab on acceleration possibly this week, but more than likely like Monday of next week. Right? Um, that way we got time to get our graphing lab in and not have overlap there. All right, so the questions I'm going to want you guys to work on. Okay, so we are looking, guys, at page 5. Okay, very end of page 5 is where it starts. Okay, moving on to page uh, 6 here. All right, and there are 20, 30, there are 30 of them. Okay, I would say maybe like jump around a little bit, okay, on these questions. Um, in fact, let's just start at number two here, just for the sake of having more questions on the screen. Okay, let's start on question number two. Okay, moving uh, moving forward here and kind of jump around randomly because I think I did these so that it's like three questions with one formula, three questions with the same formula, three. So jump around a little bit. Okay, try different questions so that you get a, a look at different formulas to use here. Okay, so starting with question number two. Okay, moving on from there, I'll come around and. Give you guys help if you need it and we can do some on the board if we need to as well okay so guys for these questions here all right um like i've, I've already walked around and I see a few people trying to like they're doing them but they're doing them in two steps they just desperately want to use the the science 10 formula calculate something and then go from there guys pretty much every question on this sheet should be able to be solved with one formula only all right so write down your givens and have a look at your acceleration formulas before you choose one the second thing is with number two, okay, it seems like it doesn't give you very much information. But if you drop something, what's its initial velocity? Zero. And if it's falling on Earth, it's falling at 9.81. So it doesn't, it's not always going to outright tell you all the numbers. Sometimes it's going to ask you, look at the context of this question, what other numbers that you know might apply here. Right? This is an example of that. 